second our Father's word, the great book of John. John means God's gift, and certainly it is a book that is a gift from God because not only was John chosen to bring this gospel to us, but the three epistles of John as well as the book of Revelation. Not that he wrote them, but that God used him to unveil them. It is important in this first chapter that you pick up on the fact of the rhythm of the Gospels, Matthew presenting Jesus as king of Israel, and Mark presenting him as a servant of God, Yahweh, and Luke presenting him as the ideal man. But John, this book, presenting Jesus as God. Therefore, verse 1 would read, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And in the 14th verse of this same chapter, you find that the Word, which was God, became flesh and walked among men. Why would this be? Well, God wanted to instruct his children, but God's in a different dimension than we are. But Christ being born as we are born was in this dimension, and um, it was God showing us the way, how he, could, how he could accomplish it. And, of course, John the Baptist appears on the scene and begins to baptize many people. And, of course, this was written, as we found, in Isaiah chapter 40, where beginning with verse 3, that voice crying from the wilderness to turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers, plural, meaning either to the true father or the false. Uh, but he, he's, John the Baptist is so successful here in the wilderness by the River Jordan, the descender, that um, the muckety ducks downtown with the big church sent some Pharisees down to ask who he was and what he was doing. And um, certainly uh, John then answered them by utilizing Isaiah chapter 40. And then we pick it up with verse 24 of this lecture. Let's go with it. Chapter 1, St. John, verse 24. Four, and it reads with that word of wisdom from our Father, and and they were and those and they which were sent were of the Pharisees, meaning the separate separated ones. Now they should have known, being Bible scholars, that God forewarned them way back in Deuteronomy chapter eighteen, verse fourteen through eighteen. And I'll say that again back in Deuteronomy 18, verse 14 through 18, that God promised then he would raise up from your own folk, just like you are, a prophet who would be the Messiah. So, you see, God never keeps secrets. And as you heard me say in the last lecture, truth is reality and it is not concealing. So God does not conceal anything from his children if you take a moment to read. So as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to run back to Deuteronomy chapter 18. And let's just see how good our Father is to us. Deuteronomy 18, verse 14 here. And... and um, and it would read then, um, For these nations which thou shalt possess hearken unto observers of times, unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee to do so. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, and thy brethren, in other words, it's going to be just right there among you. Like unto me, unto him you shall hearken. In other words, this would be Messiah. To him you listen. When that word became flesh, and, and God promised this way back in around 1451 B.C., God's word, the truth, is not concealing. 
according to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more, that I die not. But So then he promised Messiah. And when you continue reading on in that 18th chapter, you see that he is talking about Messiah. It's so simple to know. God was going to bring forth this one. It had been established long ago. And had these been the separated ones to study as they so claim, they would have known that. Verse 25 to continue. And they ask him, this is John the Baptist they're asking now, not the Apostle John, John the Baptist. And they ask him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, that Messiah, nor Elias, such to say Elijah, neither that prophet? Why are you doing it if you're not? Verse 26, John answered them, saying, I baptize with water. There standeth one among you. He's already here. One among you whom you know not, but they should have. Verse 27, he it is whom coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latcheth I am not worthy to unloose. In other words, he is Messiah, I am not. And this would be John the Baptist preparing the way in that wilderness for the Messiah to make his approach. Verse 28, these things were done in Beth Abara, beyond Jordan, uh, where John was baptizing. Now, many, many of the manuscripts will have Bethany here. Notice it says where John was baptizing. You wouldn't necessarily be baptizing at Bethany, but what does Abara mean? Of course, Beth means house. Araba means ford. Well, what's a ford? A ford's where the river is shallow enough that you can walk across it. That's why it's called a ford. You can ford the river there. This is where he was doing his baptizing. So I buy this name. I think it's correct because the very definition and translation itself properly translated documents it. He continues, 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming into him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And God was so good that he let this voice come and would let these doves approach. John the Baptist would see them, and he would hear the voice of God saying, Behold, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Verse 30, This is he of whom I said, For me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. He was from the beginning. He, he was um, uh, with God in the beginning, for he was God. How precious it is that John would say this. So, oh, he's always been that power of our Heavenly Father. You know, I, I don't want you to miss the most important thing. And ask yourself the question, why would God do this? It's important that you do that. Why would God do this? Because he loves you. He loves his children. He wanted to simplify things. Where he could come and he could talk to them right one on one. And through his very life, document the love of the living Father to his children to save them from the pit pitfalls of this earth age or any earth age. And that's why he would do it, was because of his love for the children. Verse 31, and I, I, and I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. 
Therefore am I come baptizing with water. This is why we do it. Verse 32, And John bear record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and abode upon him. That word abode is particular to John. It means to live with. And the Shekinah glory itself is God dwells there or abodes there. That's, that's part of the definition of the word in the Hebrew tongue. So th this is what he saw. That dove is symbolic of the spirit of the living God. Verse 33, And I knew him not, um, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Spirit. Uh, I'm going to translate that spirit because the word is pneuma in the manuscripts. It's not spook, and God is not a spook. So, therefore, we have the voice of God himself from heaven saying this is the one and this was himself and that spirit remains upon him what spirit the Holy Spirit of course <clears throat> excuse me and so it was verse 34 and I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God the only begotten not the son of somebody else some imaginer or something but the very Son of the living God, therefore the voice, the word, Logos, became flesh and dwelt among us. 35. Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, 36, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And... And here, the very lamb that would become our Passover lamb of all times, the Lord Jesus Christ, he that was crucified and slain on Passover of Passovers. Therefore, as it's written in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 6 and 7, Christ became our Passover, the greatest holy day among Christianity. <clears throat> and we go with the next verse, please. 37. And the two disciples heard him speak. They followed Jesus. He didn't ask them to. He didn't hold a revival. They were astonished with his word, his very presence. 38, Then Jesus turned and saw them following. And he saith unto them, What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, and this is unique of John, that rabbi will be interpreted for you, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? In other words, they're curious, and, and um, abidest or dwellest again is meno. That's important in the book of John. It means, wh wh where do you dwell? God dwells with us and within us, and we within him. That's one of the beauties of John, that it lets you know he cares. Verse 39, he said unto them, Come and see. They came and they saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day. For it was about the tenth hour. It was about 4 p.m., getting a little late. One of the two which heard John speak, and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Andrew, manly, and, and of course Simon is a hearing, and Peter means rock. Okay. Verse 41. He first findeth his own brother, Simeon, Simon rather, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah is being interpreted, and here again of John, he always interprets it, the Christ, and I will take it further than that, the anointed one. And let's even take it a little deeper. 
the very etymology of the word itself means as by rubbing with all of our people the anointed one, the Messiah Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten Son of the living God. 42. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. It is beautiful the way that John does this translating for us. Cephas, of course, what does Cephas mean? It's, it's um, Aramaic. This is in all languages, basically. It means stone. And Petros, Peter, in the Greek tongue, same thing, stone. And, of course, what is Jonah? Jonah is, in a sense, John's name in Aramaic. But at the same time, it also means the dove. And when you see that, uh, when you see Jonah, the dove descending, the absolute positive proof that it is the Holy Spirit. Now, one thing very important, let's take this a little bit further. Why would Christ break this down in so many different languages? Because on this rock, Christ would use, as he himself is our solid rock, he would use this chip off of that old block to establish the church. At the same time, if you were to go to Ezekiel chapter 28, you can find there that Satan is called Tarvis. So, and here we have a different tongue, Hebrew. What does that word Tarvis mean in the Hebrew tongue being translated? Stone. Their rock is not our rock. It's a very simple lesson, lesson that Christ and our Heavenly Father want you to absorb. Don't confuse the rocks. They can all call themselves that. Petrus, Cephas, Pyrus. Doesn't matter. You want to know the true rock from the false. Meaning what? You want to know Christ from Satan who will come as the false messiah, ultimately. And um, you're not to be confused through vocabularies or otherwise, but by the very presence itself. Uh, verse 43. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, the circuit, and findeth Philip. And he saith unto him, Follow me. Now, now there, was there an altar call there? Was um, there a lot of preaching? No, no, he simply said, follow me. Well, he knew him from the first earth age. He knew he could count on him. He knew the soul that was in Philip. Uh, uh, Philip meaning a lover of horses. And he, he, he picked, chose him just like that. But he, he didn't ask. He gave an order, follow me. Verse 44. Now, Philip was of Bethsaida, uh, the city of Andrew and Peter, um, each of them. Verse 45, Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. That's who it is. It turns out to be him. Well, naturally, he wasn't the son of Joseph. He was the son of the living God, but adopted by Joseph. Where did Moses write about Christ? The very beginning, way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where it is written there concerning the false rock, Tyrus, Satan, the serpent seed, where Christ would say, I put, will put enmity between thy seed and the woman's seed, child. He will, you will bruise his heel. He was, they were nailed to the cross. But he will crush your head. And that's how it will ultimately end out, the very prophecy itself. 
And then, then again in Genesis 49.10, it's mentioned again. So from long ago, not to mention the fact that we read a moment ago in Deuteronomy 18, beginning with verse 14, the report where God promised, I'm going to raise him up. You're going to have Messiah. Verse 46. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said unto him, Come and see. Um, Nazareth being the guarded one, what? what? And it, it was said, not, you know, there's nothing good about Nazareth. They were country people, country folk. And people under, underestimated country people back then, and they still do to this day. You know, that a country person, to be successful in agriculture, must be a perfect computer operator, a weather forecaster, a chemist due to for chemicals of the soil, of what grows and what doesn't, and must be able to know the signs and the seasons. And to try to take that away from country folk, you would be sadly mistaken. Because you would probably, the average person from the big city, if you were to move them out in the country, they'd starve. They couldn't cut it. Why? They're ignorant when it comes to how God's natural order of things prevail to be successful. In other words, to have the earth furnish its goodness. You, you must know those things. So certainly, in, in the first place, uh, to cut this way short, Jesus wasn't born at Nazareth to start out with. Jesus was, was born in Bethlehem. Well, what does Bethlehem mean? The house of bread. And he is the bread of life, born right there at that house of bread and walked among us. Uh, you know, it, it is well to always be informed from God's word whereby people who would try to trip you up, as Nathaniel did, what good thing has ever come from Nazareth? A lot of good things came from Nazareth. Country people. 47, Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him. And he saith of him, Behold an Israelite, indeed, in whom is no guile. Now, um, what, what is, why would he say an Israelite? Let him know. I, I know more about you probably than you know about yourself. Israelite means the prince that prevailed with God. And, and the, the true house of Israel so following. And when saying there was no guile, he was an honest man, straightforward. Verse 48, Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. It is amazing how Christ works things into the ministry. But you know, why would the fig tree be brought into this? It means there's something hidden. You weren't hidden from me, Nathaniel. But at the same time, the teaching goes back to the parable of the fig tree. And where was this fig mentioned? All the way back in the great book of Genesis, in that same chapter 3 that we just mentioned, of that first prophecy concerning Messiah, what was it that Adam and Eve, after they sinned, covered themselves with? Fig leaves. Um, here we have this one. There's nothing hidden to Christ. He sees everything. But at the same time, he weaves in the leaders that he would establish that would ultimately come to God's elect who would be of that fig tree generation. And as you know from the 13th chapter of Mark, that fig tree generation in their lifetime and the prophecies pertaining to it 
then all prophecies would be fulfilled. So Christ is kind and he is good. Here, this one that was being hesitant and just a little bit with a negative sense, he's soothing down and swaying him by letting him know, I know more about you than probably you know about yourself. And in a real nice way. Let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 49. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. And therefore, he's convinced him. Convinced him by a little truth, a little knowledge. And, and um, many people would call that a miracle. Well, it really isn't. Because Nathaniel was with God, he knew him very well. You might say, well, how would he know him before he was in the flesh? Well, he did Jeremiah. Read the first chapter of Jeremiah, in the first six verses, God tells Jeremiah, I knew you before you ever entered your mother's womb. And while you were in your mother's womb, I designated you as a prophet. So God knows much. He knows everything. But yet he gives us our will and way, whereby you can do with your life as you choose. You can really mess it up, or, or you can be blessed. It's your choice. That's the way our Father operates. But Nathaniel here is convinced. Verse 50, to continue. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, Believest thou, question? Thou shalt see greater things than these. In other words, Jesus already knows in his ministry he's going to heal the sick, he's going to raise people from the dead. He will feed multitudes with very small amounts with the explosion of God's very presence. <clears throat> that you haven't you you haven't really seen anything yet compared to the ministry that will transpire as we that are following and myself, the Messiah, put together and bring forth. And beloved, it holds true to this day. You really haven't seen anything yet compared to what will befall us in the end times, in the sixth and the seventh trumps. It is awesome what God will do for his election in this very time. What a time to believe. What a time to be led. What a time to know Messiah, to know the Anointed One, and to be anointed with the very oil of our people, yeah. but most of all anointed with the Holy Spirit, giving knowledge and wisdom and understanding of the very manuscripts themselves. 51 to complete this chapter. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open." And the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. In other words, I have that communication. So it would be in the garden that they would come, they would minister to him. Do you think this is the first time that happened? It isn't. It happened way back in, in uh, the book of Genesis, in chapter 28. And... Uh, verse, chapter 28, verse 14, and it's written there concerning Messiah. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, to the east, and to the north, and to the south, and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into the land 
I will not leave thee. And Jacob awake, verse 16. Jacob awaked out of his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord of this is in this place. And I knew it not. And he was afraid and he said, How dreadful in this place. This is there this is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. It's where that that and Jacob rose up early in the morning and he took the stone that he had put for his pillow and he set up said he he set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. This is that stone that a ladder appeared to him in this vision and it opened the very gates of heaven. What did God want us to know from that? That he's real. He's in touch. You mean you cannot see into that dimension unless he allows you to. But that does not mean he is not there. That does not mean that that ladder is not there. The ladder of communication between you and the Heavenly Father. When he has his hand upon you. When he directs his children. When he guides them. He has every access to those that believe when he so chooses. So this is what Christ is talking about here. That he has the attention of Almighty God at any moment, any time that he is needed. And naturally being the Logos, the Word, become flesh, then naturally in that dimension that God came to us. All right, don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart, you listen a moment. Okay, question please. time. We're going to go with Anne from Mississippi. I... Um, I am uh, right. Uh, I want to know, um, will God forgive if you don't know all the words in the Bible? When I read the Bible, I do not know all of the words in there. Thank you for your help. Well, that's, that's why God sends teachers, okay? When you love him, that's sufficient within itself. He has a way to communicate whereby you'll be just fine. So uh, I do not, I believe probably that English is not your native uh, language from your sentence structure, but that doesn't matter. God loves you. You're a child of the living God. Um, Ernest from West Virginia. I would like to know about the mark in the forehead and the right hand were, I've always been taught they, it's uh, that way. I really enjoy watching you, but confused with this question. Well, what does it mean? What's in your forehead? Not on it, in it. In your forehead is your brain. That's what God judges you by, is what you, your thought process. What you think and what you do. Not something that's marked on you. That's, that's not something, you know, people could force marks all over your body, but your mind would, could still be in perfect order with God. So it's what's in your mind. Meaning this, if you are deceived by the Antichrist and worship him, you received his mark. That is the mark. It's in your brain. You're deceived, ignorant of God's word in the actual chronological order of events that transpire and bring to pass the end of this age when he makes it so simple and clear in his word. Now, what throws many people is the mark in the hand. They've got to say, well, it does say in the hand. Yes, it does. But what do you use your hands for? To do work. It means they will not only be deceived in their mind, but they're going to work for Satan. <clears throat> they're going to deliver up their own camp they will be doing the work of Satan. This has the same application as in Mark 13 where it says, Woe to those that are with child and that give suck when I return. It means those that, it doesn't mean a mother with a child in her womb. It means those that are spiritually impregnated. And not only are spiritually impregnated in doing Satan's following, but actually nurse it along 
help bring it to pass. <clears throat> How would you like to stand on Judgment Day and have to answer for that? That I, really it was. I went to church all my life. And then I ended up worshiping Satan, thinking he was Christ. And, I, and not only that, I helped his work. I helped do Satan's work. That wouldn't be a fun trip, my friend. You do not want that to happen. So you learn the truth, and the truth will always set you free. Uh, Maggie from North Carolina. We love your teaching. Thank you for that comment. And uh, did I hear you say there were people on earth before Adam and Eve? If so, please explain so I can understand. And another question, were all the prophets on the, of the Bible in the first world age? Uh, Absolutely. Jer Jeremiah, God tells him in chapter 1, verse 1 of Jeremiah, I knew you before you entered your mother's womb. Okay. And while you were in the room, I designated you as prophet. In other words, from the first earth age, God knew what he would do. He knew he could trust him. He knew he was loyal, and he could depend upon him. Um, yes, there were... There were people, you have to go into the Hebrew manuscripts a little bit to know and to understand. And, but um, on the sixth day, God created many of the races, made hunters out of some of them and fishers out of others. And then he rested the seventh day, and, and then he created a husbandman, meaning a farmer, somebody to tend the soil. And, and then on the eighth day, he made that eth ha -adam. In the manuscripts, that is a different man. It would be the man and the woman, Mother Eve, through which Christ would come. And he even created more special animals where this man, as a farmer, could form the soil. And uh, domestic animals that he would utilize. Uh, rather than wild animals on the sixth day that you hunt. So it's very simple and very clear, and I recommend that if you really care that much, order the first six chapters of Genesis in DVD, and I teach you how to read the Hebrew to come to that understanding. Uh, Laurel from Illinois, question. Thank you for helping me understand the Bible. It's scary sometimes when I listen to some things I hear, but the truth is the truth. I sin most of my life, and I'm not good like God all the time now. Well, none of us are as good as God is. Our very righteous acts are as filthy rags compared to God's graciousness, okay? But I, I've learned from my mistakes, and I hope and I pray that God will forgive me in Jesus' name, I pray. I've affected other people by my acts, and now I'm trying to make things right with them, my wife, my kids, and some friends. Can you go to hell for causing other people to react uh, and do wrong for your sin? Well, when you repent, you're forgiven. That's the beauty of forgiveness. And each person must answer for themselves. You, you're not... You're not responsible for anyone else when you um, apologize and you're, you're trying to set it right. You have nothing to worry about. You're in the hands of God when you say, do, in Jesus' name, I do this. You're in good shape. You keep it up. We all, there's none of us perfect, so don't set yourself out to think you've got to be perfect before you're going to heaven. Because in the flesh, that would be almost an impossibility. We lack perfection. Dorothy from Canada, can you tell us, is it, is it, if it says in the Bible that when you die, you should not be cremated, but be buried in a casket? We would appreciate it if you could let us know the answer or any available booklets. Well, the available booklet is the Bible itself. In the Bible itself, you will read in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, that when you pass away, 
then instantly the spirit, which is the intellect of your soul, returns to the Father from whence it came with your spiritual body. But your flesh body goes back to dust from which it came. It doesn't matter how it gets back to dust, you're true with it. So there is, um, I, I know that in hard times, um, it, is, it is a lot less expensive to go with cremation without having the expense of caskets. And they're already with the Father anyway, so there's no problem with that if, if, if uh, one chooses. No, nothing wrong with cremation. We have a, a new body. It doesn't get old, it doesn't get sick, it lives forever, if you're a believer. Uh, P.E. from Georgia. Will Pastor Murray be back or has he retired? I enjoy the Bible teaching and questions and answers. My question is, will we be male and female in heaven? Someone told me you would all be, we would all be males, and I don't believe that. How would I know my mom if she wasn't female? Well, that's a good deduction. We, we are as the angels and you're not given in marriage or taken in marriage. Jesus makes that very clear in, in the scriptures. But, uh, and I have not retired. You know, if God chooses you to teach, there is no retiring. You have to go until the end comes. And then you're with the Heavenly Father. So there's a, a real dedicated man or woman of God. There's no such thing as retiring. So there you go. We thank our Father for for the opportunity to teach his word. Uh, Mike from Michigan, I have a question. Can you explain what's going on in Mark chapter 14, verses 51 through 52? Well, there, there is a young man there, and as they are breaking up the apostles, and somebody grabs the outer coat of this young man, and he, as the scripture says, he runs away naked. It means without his outer coat. That young man, uh, he, he was always present when the apostles met, especially at his mother's house. He, he was always there. His name is Mark John, the author of the great book of Mark, the shortest gospel, but very vivacious, vivacious and moving. As only a youngster as he could bring it forth in, in that way. So it was Mark John. They didn't get him. He was fast. He was gone. Uh, Sue from Illinois. I take medicine for my pancreas that has pork in it. My doctor tried to find some medicine without the pork in it, but didn't. So what do I do? Well, pancreas is a very important part of the body. You're not eating pork. It's been refined and worked into a medicine, evidently, that is good for the pancreas that keeps you alive. So um, uh, we have to utilize common sense. If, if you were to uh, decide to, knowing that God doesn't want us to, of the swine you shall not eat, then that would be if you broke over and ripped, but that's a different thing. When it comes to medicine or many people, um, for emergency sakes, for valves of the heart, to uh, have pork valves, and, uh, and so it is. Uh, so that's not eating pork. That's surviving for Almighty God so that you can pass on his word. Bob from Florida. What is, I, I might just say another word on that. <clears throat> Our Father lets us know in 1 Timothy chapter 4 that uh, you can partake of all the animals God created to be received. Okay. But then he goes on to say all animals are good. They're good for their purpose. And if their purpose is to provide a part, then more power to it. Bob from Florida, what is the mark of the beast? What is the number of the mark of the beast? The mark of the beast is in your forehead. 
as you read in the great 13th chapter of the book of Revelation, that its number is 666. And as you become a student of God's book of Revelation, one of the first things you notice is that the Antichrist, pretending to be Christ, comes in the sixth seal, the sixth uh, trump, and the sixth vial. So that's 666. So his number is to come at the sixth seal, sixth trump, and sixth vial. Naturally, the seals you place in your mind and know he is coming at the sixth trump, and the true Christ doesn't come until the seventh. So therefore, you're not going to be deceived, and no one could possibly deceive you because you know the chronological order of events. That's why it's very important. Ron from Washington, where can I find the scriptures of all races created? Genesis chapter 1. He created man and uh, told him to replenish the earth. He made hunters out of some and fishers out of others. He rested the seventh day and then made the farmer Eth ha Adam. That's the man Adam through which Christ would come through Eve. Ronnie from Ohio. Are you responsible for what you teach me? You're, absolutely. Judgment begins at the pulpit. That's 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. A person that does not realize that and preaches is in a heap of hurt because you better do your homework. You better know what you're teaching because you will be held responsible. And if you, in this case, if you set yourself up as a pastor and mislead a flock into sinning, you're responsible for every sin they commit. You might say, well, I thought it said that a father's son could, well, you're not their father. You're their pastor. And you will answer for their sins if you taught them. So uh, it's, a, it's a heavy thing, and I never let that sway someone from taking on the responsibility. All you have to do is do your best, and that's good enough for the Father. Uh, Pastor Murray, Eugene from North Carolina. I was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, as Peter said in Acts 2.38. I know Jesus told his 11 disciples in Matthew 28, 19 to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I always thought that name was Jesus. Tell me, please, which is right and why. They both are. You see, you, you would have to, what does Jesus mean when you say it? You're saying all three. In the first place, Jesus was God. Jesus, let's, let's say it in the Hebrew tongue, Yeshua. Well, what does Yeshua mean? Yeshua means Yahweh's Savior, which is Messiah, which is the Christ, and whoever those two are, that's the Father and the Son, you have the presence of the Holy Spirit, even down through to the Shekinah glory. That is to say, God dwells there. So... Uh, I, I know that even religion split over this, and it is so sad because they, they show their ignorance of language because it's all the same thing. Uh, Mark from, Mac, rather, from Kentucky, where in the Bible does it say that Jesus told his disciples to buy themselves a sword? I remember having read that somewhere in the Bible. You remember now that the Apostle Peter did draw a sword and he cut off the ear of a soldier, Malchus, he cut his ear off and Christ put it back. You're thinking about Luke chapter 22, verse 36. Is it religiously lawful for a private citizen, civilian, American citizen to own a gun in the USA according to Scripture? Jesus told Peter, put away your sword. I'm going to own a gun as long as I live. Well, good for you. That's, uh, that's our Constitution, which comes from 
the general law from Great Britain declares that in the First and the Second Amendment that we have freedom of religion and we have the right to bear arms, to protect your family. You know, a lot of people don't realize that many, you know, they live in these big cities and they, they really don't know how to live as far as I'm concerned because I live in the country. I got room to breathe because it's miles between this and that. And if I needed to call a policeman, there's not one within miles. So if I have to defend my family, I have to do it myself.